Hello, welcome back to the Archeria Pigments 3 video series. Today we're having a look at the keyboard tab. Now, rather than being a focused subject, as was the case with envelopes and LFOs, where we deal with a single thing, this is more of a kind of catch-all area where anything related to the keyboard is collected together. But there is some really important functionality in here that we need to pick our way through. Let's go from left to right. First of all, we've got our pitch bend control, and you can see that you've got different values for up and down. What this basically means is that we can say that if I have um, six up and two down, if I hold my C down, we've got our tuner, um, you'll see that we go from C up six semitones to G flat, back down to C, and then down to a B flat. Pretty straightforward. Double click, set it back to the default of two. And I can actually manually interact with the pitch bend control from the graphical interface. To the left of it, we've got our modulation wheel. Now, here's my modulation wheel. I'm currently turning it physically on the keyboard and you can see it going up and down. And by default, it doesn't do anything. The modulation wheel is the most open-ended and generic modulation source on your keyboard. It's really wonderful. And we can get to it from its own dedicated modulation page so having entered the modulation wheel zoom view, I can now apply some modulation wheel control to my filter cutoff. And you can see that as I move the modulation wheel, the pink line in the modulation viewer tells you what the current value is. If I move the wheel, it strobes up and down to track the current modulation wheel setting and then sticks there. So when I press a key on the keyboard, that's how much modulation is being applied to the current offset. So my filter cutoff is currently set to 12 o'clock. And then you can see the little blue dot. If I hover over the knob, you can see the little blue dot representing the current modulation wheel value. Turn the wheel up, turn the wheel down. Fabulous interface. And we've got master tune, that's pretty straightforward. If you want to, I don't know, jam along with Jimi Hendrix tunes, which are all tuned one semitone low, you can basically set your master tune here. So you're still playing in E, but you really play in E flat. Then we've got micro tuning, which I frankly never use, but you can turn it on, get some pretty exotic standard tuning. So I'll just pre uh, play a regular C scale uh, on all the white keys. see in the tuner that I'm playing C here but we're getting the G flat so it just basically offsets the keys I don't know anything about exotic scales but that's what it does this is a really important setting poly 8 is how many notes polyphony the keyboard has so if I set it to 2 play a C and then an E and then a G I just threw the C away we no longer have a C so this is the maximum number of notes that the synthesizer will generate at any given time. Now I'm going to set this back up to a, a nice healthy value in order to have a quick look at this steel value. Now there's actually nothing in the manual about this. They've basically missed this section out of the manual. So you either have to look it up online or figure out for yourself what it's doing. What the, uh, the, oh, the options are reassign and rotate. And what this control is concerned with is what happens when you press the same key multiple times. So I'm going to set it to reassign mode. I'm going to give my envelope a nice big healthy release. Turn it up a little bit so that you can hear this more clearly. Now, can you see in the oscilloscope, every time I'm playing a key, it sounds exactly the same no matter how fast I play it. That's because every time I press that key, any previous instance of that note is being thrown away and we're starting to play the key again. As opposed to rotate, which will use as many voices as the synth has to constantly replay that key. And what you're gonna get is an emulation of unison kind of sound because it's going to play multiple copies of the sound, all using different voices. But because they've all been started from different points in their phase, you'll get a kind of unison effect. And 
in the oscilloscope, the sound gets increasingly complex. As all of those different notes interact with each other. And the higher your polyphony setting, the more notes you're adding on top of each other. It's basically using each of the individual voice slots in the synthesizer to stack them all on top of each other. Hold is pretty self-explanatory. Press a key on the keyboard. It does exactly that. Much more interesting when we get on to deal with the sequencer and the arpeggiator where you can press a key and then just have something disappear off into the ether and never stop. Then we have glide mode. So these two controls are connected. Uh, at the moment we have a glide time of zero. So glide is permanently on. If I press a C and then a C and an octave above, you don't hear any gliding between those notes, but glide is actually permanently on. If I set a glide time of anything other than zero, and do exactly the same thing. Now I'm gliding between those notes and I'm taking 186 milliseconds. to perform the operation. So if we make it really long. Now at the moment we're in always mode, so it doesn't matter whether or not I play a single note and then wait and then play a new single note, we get the glide, or hold one note down and then press a second note, we still get a glide. If I turn always off, Press a single note, and now a new single note, no glide. Hold one note down, legato, up to another, and then you get the glide. So normally you would see the word legato in an interface, you'd have a little drop down box, but they've basically just given you an all, always mode, which is either on or off. Then we have a little graphical interface over here, which has three different curves and they are all independent. If I click anywhere in this window, I get basically four nodes in total or up to four nodes. If I right click on a node, I can get rid of it and then left click to bring it back in. And then you can see I can get these little arrow symbols where I can change the shape of the curve, add a new node, do some shenanigans, switch to a different shape and I get a new wave. So each of these three controls map to three different modulation options. We've got velocity, aftertouch and keyboard. And what they basically do is apply a modulation amount to whatever they're mapped to. This is how we get to make the keyboard touch sensitive. You might not have noticed actually, but by default, if I press a key as lightly as I can and then as hard as I can, there's no difference in volume. So the default behavior of this synthesizer in the default preset is that there's no velocity sensitivity. It's really easy for us to map velocity sensitivity um, to the synth though. So if we have our master output volume and then give ourselves some modulation, I've just mapped this velocity curve to my faster output volume. So now I'll press a, a light key and you can actually see on the graph where my velocity value was. Hit a key harder, we go higher up on the velocity curve and therefore modulate the volume. So that's how you get yourself velocity sensitivity really easily. Same kind of concept with aftertouch. But in the case of aftertouch, which I'll just plug in, get rid of our velocity stuff and give ourselves some aftertouch instead. You need a keyboard that's capable of generating aftertouch commands. So if I press a key, I'm, I'm pressing all of these keys quite lightly and then a bit harder and then really pretty hard. None of that has got anything to do with aftertouch. Aftertouch is a spongy area after you've pressed the key, where you go into this spongy area in your keyboard, and now you can hear me going up and down, you can actually see it graphically as I press further into the key, 
it goes further along the uh, the after touch curve because I've drawn a weird shape here. We're getting increases and decreases in volume at various sounds, and it's making it sound like static. Get rid of that. And finally, keyboard basically maps your modulation source to your keyboard itself. So if I make this a little bit simpler to understand. Now, keyboard's a bit weird. I've just reset it so that it's as linear as possible. And I'm going to demonstrate it using the filter cutoff. What I'm going to do is turn the filter cutoff to 12 o'clock. And then assign some keyboard modulation to it. Can you see that it's bipolar? That's using a C3 center point. So if I press C3 on the keyboard, you can see that the little highlighted dot on the curve is exactly in the middle. So that's the seesaw axis point. And now if I press a higher key on the keyboard, we're gonna basically like virtually turn the filter up. So the filter gets sharper and sharper. I just disengage the cutoff. It's a duller sound. Now it's brighter. And all of the notes below C3 will be the opposite. Duller, brighter. Basically the flipped logic because we're below the central seesaw axis point. And that's the keyboard section dealt with. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit the like button. I'll see you for the next episode. Thanks very much for watching.